In the last two sections, we've looked at, um, a pro well, a, first we looked informally at approximating functions by their Taylor polynomials. I say informally because we just said, oh, uh, we make these derivatives, we make the derivative of the function match the derivatives of these polynomials at A, at a point A, and then we just kind of assume that that should make the polynomials a good approximation of the function for X close to A. In the last section, we got more formal, and we, we analyzed the error in that approximation, so we could actually say something about the error was less than or equal to this amount. Right now, when we've written the, the Taylor series, the infinite series, it's just been a formal, algebraic, never-ending kind of polynomial. It's something that just keeps going, and it's really just... Uh, it's really just saying we know all of the, the Taylor polynomials and we're not going to indicate where we stop because, in, you know, because we're interested in using different values of n to get different amounts of accuracy. But we would like to see if we can make sense of this infinite sum, so as the, of the Taylor series, as a function. Right? It's some kind of, it, we write a bunch of pluses and a dot, 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 or a sum is k goes from, one, uh, from 0 to infinity, but um, that doesn't mean that we're trying to define a function, or we haven't been. But now we're going to. We would like to know when we can define that infinite sum in some meaningful way, and when that infinite sum, that inf kind of this never-ending polynomial, this, in this power series function, equals the function f of x that we started with. So you have f of x. You, you look at its Taylor series at some point A, that gives you this, this power series that's just a formal algebraic thing, but then we want to say, ah, but this formal algebraic thing also defines a function, and we want to know when that function equals the function f of x that we started with. So let's look at, let's look at an example um, that we've done a lot of work on already so that we can see what's happening. Let's let f of x equal e to the x. What, we, what we've seen is that the nth Maclaurin error, so the error in approximating e to the x by its nth order Maclaurin polynomial, so Taylor polynomial centered at 0, is the absolute value of the remainder. And the remainder is we use the Lagrange form of the remainder. It's the n plus first derivative of f evaluated at this number c. I'll remind you what that is in a second. Times x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. Where c is some number. Between the center, between 0 and x. All right. And yes, if, if x is not 0, um, if x is not 0 itself, then c is in the open interval between 0 and x. And if you want to include the case where x is 0, you could just say c is in the closed interval from 0 to x. OK, so great. So what? Well, we know all the derivatives of e to the x. All the derivatives of e to the x are e to the x, so that this nth plus first derivative of f evaluated at c is, is just e to the c. OK. Um, and this is positive. n plus 1 factorial is positive. So all of this is e to the c times the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. And then there are, well, two cases. If x is greater than or equal to 0, then since e to the x is an increasing function, the biggest that e to the anything gets between 0 and x, if x is greater than 0, would be e to the x. So this is less than or equal to e to the x times the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. This is if x is greater than or equal to 0, and, or it's 
if x is less than 0, then still raising e to a power is an increasing function. And the biggest, the biggest e to the, to the anything would get between a negative number and 0 is it e to the, would be at 0. So that would be e to the 0. That's 1. So either e to the c is less than or equal to 1. Um, well, actually, if x is less than 0, or if c is less than 0, it would be strictly strictly less than, but we're just going to, less than or equal to is good for us. So this is less than or equal to the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 factorial times 1. This is if x is less than or equal to 0. All right, so I won't put that times 1. What's the point? The point is that we can say that the error is less than one of these two things, depending on whether x is greater than or equal to 0, or less than or equal to 0. But what happens is n gets very large. So what happens is n approaches infinity. Well, e to the x doesn't change. And here we have the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial, just like we have here. And my claim, and I'll do this in a second, I claim that the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial is 0. Understand, x is fixed here. You, you fix x, and then you look at what happens as n gets very large. Um, let's assume that for the moment. If that's true, then as n goes to infinity, this goes to 0, this goes to 0. So in either case, the limit as n goes to infinity of the error, well, it's always less than or equal to 0. Um, and it's the absolute value of something, so it's greater than or equal to 0. So what we get is the limit as n approaches infinity of the error is 0. All right. But the error is the absolute value of the remainder. This is the same as saying, so if something's absolute value goes to 0 if and only if the thing itself goes to 0. So this is equivalent to saying that the limit as n goes to infinity of the remainder is 0. This, <laughs> remember what the remainder is. It's the value of the function. It's the value of the function minus the value of the nth order Maclaurin polynomial. But as in, so we're saying this equals 0. But this doesn't change as n goes to infinity. So this is the same as saying f of x minus the limit as n goes to infinity of tn fx equals 0. Or what's the same thing, and here's what we're after, that f of x is the limit as n goes to infinity of the Maclaurin polynomials of f. Right. So, what am I saying? Well, assuming that we believe this claim, I'm saying that when f of x is e to the x, for any x value, the limit as n goes to infinity of the error is 0, which means that f of x itself is the limit as n goes to infinity of the values of the Taylor of the Maclaurin polynomials evaluated at that x. So, the limit of the Maclaurin polynomials, well, those are polynomials that go out to higher and higher n's, and as n goes to infinity, well, that's what the infinite sum should be. So this is what we do. We define the infinite sum as a function to be the limit of the values of the, of the Maclaurin polynomials, or more general, the Taylor polynomials. And then when that limit equals the value of the original function, then it's the same as saying that the limit of the error in the Taylor approximation is 0, so that, yeah, we can say the function equals that Taylor series, sorry, Maclaurin series. So um, let, me, let me give you an argument for this. This won't be a rigorous proof, but we're going to use this a couple of more times. So I would like to tell you why this is true. This should be a convincing argument. Um, So first of all, 
let me, if this, I'm assuming you know, although we'll prove this in a more, much more general form later, that if you've got some number r, uh, let me, if r has absolute value less than 1, then the limit as n goes to infinity of, well, I guess I'll write r to the n plus 1. I could equally as well write r to the n. That this is 0. If you take a number whose absolute value is less than 1, and you keep raising it to bigger and bigger powers, you get something smaller and smaller that approaches 0. If r is between 0 and 1, this would always be positive and get closer, and get arbitrarily close to 0. If r is negative, then you still get closer and closer to 0, but the sign would alternate between plus and minus as n goes up one at a time. So we're assuming this, uh, I'm assuming you know this. So it's like saying that, for instance, like a half to the n plus 1 as n plus 1, as n goes to infinity. You keep multiplying half times itself, you get closer and closer to 0. You get a smaller and smaller, uh, well, a smaller and smaller positive number. Okay, so assuming this is true, why is this true? Even if x, if the absolute value of x doesn't, isn't less than 1, why is this true? Well, because the denominator gets big, bigger than the numerator. Why does that happen? So let's just look at what's going on. In the numerator, you have the absolute value of x multiplied times itself n plus 1 times. And in the denominator, you have the integers 1 through n plus 1 multiplied times themselves. So you get 1, 2, maybe I'll put another x in here just so things match. One, two, three, out to n plus one. So what? Well, x is fixed, and at some point, n plus one will get bigger than the absolute value of x. So let's suppose, you know, let's suppose we call. Um, the first time when that happens, the first integer for which that happens, for n naught, so that, or n sub zero, so that um, suppose n sub zero is the first um, positive integer such that the absolute value of x is less than n naught plus one. Then when you have this, what happens? Well, the terms before that would be the absolute value of x to the n naught over, you'd have an n naught here, you'd have n naught factorial. And then you'd have a times the absolute value of x over n naught plus 1. And then the next thing, if you, if you keep going as n gets bigger, you'd have another times the absolute value of x, now times an n naught plus 2. And then you'd have a times the absolute value of x times an n naught plus 3. But we raise the denominator. The denominator got bigger, so this fraction, and everything's positive, so this fraction got smaller. This fraction's smaller. So that this thing is less than or equal to, well, this part's not, I'm just leaving this part alone, but this, this part is less than this term cubed. So that this whole thing is less than or equal to x, the absolute value of x to the n naught over n naught factorial times the absolute value of x to the n naught plus 1 uh, divided by n naught plus 1 cubed. But then as you keep going out, this part just keeps getting bigger. But the absolute value of x divided by n naught plus 1 has absolute value less than 1. And we just keep raising this to a higher and higher power as we go out farther. This part doesn't change, but we just said if you take something with absolute value less than 1, and raise it to higher and higher powers, it approaches zero. So that this part approaches zero, it's multiplied times this fixed thing. So yes, this limit is zero. All right, hopefully that was convincing. Um, so what do we conclude from this? 
I said it, let me say it again. It's what we conclude is that for all the x's, the error approaches 0. And so it means that e to the x equals the limit as n approaches infinity of its nth order Taylor polynomial, so Maclaurin polynomial centered at 0. So this is e to the x equals the limit as n goes to infinity of, remember what the Taylor polynomials of e to the x centered at 0 look like, so Maclaurin polynomials. I'll write one more. They look like this. And so we decide that the function that's the infinite series means this limit. So what I'm saying is in place of this limit, we just write this series, this power series that we've written before, but we didn't claim it equaled e to the x as a function. We just said this was its Taylor series. But now what I'm saying is if you define If you define the function that's, or a function by taking the limit of the Maclaurin polynomials, then that limit equals e to the x. And so that is how we'll view infinite series as functions. You take the limit of the partial sums of the series, so the limit of the polynomials of the various orders, and, um, and define that as a function. And then you want it to equal the function you started with that gave you that Taylor series. So let me write this carefully. So ah, I should say, you should recall that, well, it would be nice if you recalled that this is completely circular for us at this point because our definition of e to the exponential function, x of x, which is what, how we define e to the x, our definition of it was that it was the limit of these polynomials if you look back on how we defined e to the x. So it's nice to know that we've come back around. But for other functions, we'll see that they equal their Maclaurin series or Taylor series and even even when those functions weren't, weren't defined that way in the first place. Um, all right. So, what am I saying? I'm saying that we want, we define the function, so the power series function. So as a function, t infinity f x a. So the Taylor series of f centered at a, but now as a function, not just as an algebraic object, we define this to be this limit. So you fix, x is fixed, a is fixed, and you let n get bigger. Provided this exists, define the power series function um, to equal this if the limit exists. <coughs> we say, i.e., if the series converges. converges at x. Right. Saying that this limit exists, so an equal some number L, is what it means for the, the power series, the Taylor series. Um, so in fact, the Taylor, it is a power series, but let me say, the Taylor series function. 
we define it to be the limit of the Taylor polynomials, provided the limit exists. And the terminology that people use is we say that the Taylor series, um, the Taylor series of F centered at A converges at X. All right. Um, so there are two questions, and they, it may not seem like they're separate, but in a way they are. Two questions. when, so for what x, does the Taylor series converge? And when it does converge, when does it converge to f of x so that it equals the function we started with? So these, well, if, the second question, of course, is not independent of the first one. And when, does, when does the Taylor series converge? So where does it converge? And then when it does converge, does it converge to the function we started with? Um, we're going to look at this question when power series, not just Taylor series. We're going to look at this more carefully in the next section. In this section, we're just going to talk about when Taylor series converge to the function that you started with. Um, let me give you an example where Taylor series converges, but not to what you started with. I won't verify that it has that property, but I'll give you the classic example. So, here's an example. This is, suppose f of x is the very bizarre function, or unusual function. It's e to the negative 1 over x squared if x is unequal to 0. And it's 0 if x equals 0. If you were to graph this, or have a computer or calculator graph it, what, you would see, what you'll see that it does is there's a horizontal asymptote at 1. And the graph of this is extraordinarily flat. It's not a straight line, but it's, it's so close you won't be able to tell the difference on your computer, probably, um, or your calculator, unless you zoom way in, and I mean way in. Um, the graph of this function comes in extraordinarily flat at the origin. In fact, it's why, how flat is it? <laughs> it's so flat. It's, uh, its derivative is zero, so the tangent line is horizontal. Its second derivative is zero. Its third derivative is zero. All of its derivatives are zero. That is not easy to show. It is not easy to show, and I'm not going to, that all the derivatives of this function are zero at the origin. So that fn of the nth derivative of f at the origin is always zero. This means that the Maclaurin series for x, well, these are part of the coefficients in the Maclaurin series, right? The Maclaurin series looks like, so let me, I'll write a k, it doesn't matter what we call it, but what we just said is for all k, the kth derivative is zero, but the Maclaurin series looks like this. So once the function all of its derivatives are zero, this is just the zero function. So the Maclaurin series for this function is the zero function. Well, the zero function always exists. So 
this converges everywhere. It's always zero. That, you know, what's the limit is, um, and in fact, let me, we can just go to n. All of the, all of the Taylor polynomials, all the Maclaurin polynomials are zero. So what's the limit of zero as zero goes to, inf uh, as n goes to infinity? The limit of zero as n goes to infinity? Zero. So t infinity exists and is zero, as I said a second ago. This exists, it converges for all x and it's zero, but it doesn't equal the original function, right? It does right at x equals zero, but it doesn't any place else. So yeah, the, the Taylor series converges to the function at x equals a. That's always true. We've talked about that before. A function always equals its Taylor series at the center. The question is, does it equal its Taylor series in some interval around the center? So in some, at least some open interval around the center. And the answer is no. This one does not equal its um, Taylor series any place except, any place except when x is zero. That's, um, this is an extraordinary example. This will not normally be true. Sometimes we have to stay fairly close to the center to, uh, f to equal the Taylor series. And you can come up with other bizarre examples. But our normal, <laughs> our normal functions um, will equal their Taylor series in some interval around the origin. So, um, so we've already said that if f of x is e to the x, then no matter what x is, f of x is equal to its Maclaurin series. So that, so this says two things. It says that the Maclaurin series converges for all x and that it always converges to f of x. So we just write for all x. e to the x equals 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial dot dot dot. Okay. This is what this is um what we write. Okay and in general what we want to show when, when what you're trying to show is that a Taylor series converges and what it converges to is f of x, that's the same as saying that the error approach is zero. So saying, just as it was when we did this, saying that tfxa converges to f of x, this is equivalent to saying that the error approach is zero. That's what, how we started with the example of e to the x. It's equivalent to saying the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth order error that this is zero. So, this is what we'll do in this section. So for the rest of our examples, we'll look at error terms. We'll show that we're, we're only going to use Maclaurin series. A will always be zero force in this section. That's not necessary, but we kind of like Maclaurin series the best. Um, we're going to show that the errors approach zero, and that tells you that the Taylor series converges, the Taylor series converge, and that what it, they converge to is the function that you started with. So what's another function that we can deal with? Actually, we can deal with sine and cosine immediately. And at the same time. So suppose, so here's another example. Suppose f of x equals either the sine of x or the cosine of x. I don't care which one. 
because we're going to do the same thing. Then the error term The nth order Maclaurin error is, well, we know it's the absolute value. There's this nth plus first derivative of f evaluated at this mystery c times x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And as we did before when we were estimating error with sine, um, what, what did we say? We said that all the derivatives of sine or cosine, either one of them, all the derivatives of sine and cosine are plus or minus sine or cosine. And when you take the absolute value, plus or minus sine or cosine, it's just the absolute value of sine or cosine. The absolute value of sine and cosine is always less than or equal to 1, because sine and cosine are always between plus and minus 1. So that regardless of what c is, this, because we have absolute value signs around everything, this part will give us the absolute value of this is less than or equal to 1. So this is less than or equal to the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. Oh, <laughs> but this is the quantity we just looked at before in the e to the x example. As n goes to infinity, we know that no matter what x is, this approach is 0. This is what we just used earlier. So once again, in either case, we know that the limit as n goes to infinity of the error term is 0 which means that the Taylor series for sine converges to the actual to sine. And the Taylor series for cosine converges to cosine. So now, now we can write what we avoided writing before. That a function equals its Taylor series as, as a function. Right? Earlier, this Maclaurin series was just a an algebraic thing, but in sine you get all the odd terms. You get to where you remember these if you use them often enough. You get all the odd powers of x divided by the corresponding factorial, but the sine alternates. And now we're just going to say it keeps going. This is for all x, so both of these, for all x. And cosine of x gives you the even terms. So cosine of x, including x to the 0, which is 1. And then you, you get the even powers of x. Divided by the corresponding factorial, and the sine alternates again. Right? I'll remind you, I want to say again, you know, what does this infinite sum as a function mean? It means the limit of the partial sum. So we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity of what you get if you look at this, then you look at the value of this polynomial, then you look at the value of this polynomial, then you look at the value of this polynomial, and you just keep letting the degree of your polynomial, so the order of your Taylor polynomial, get bigger and bigger. And our claim is that the limit as n goes to infinity, is that? Well, it's not our claim. We showed it. I mean, it's our claim, but it's more than a claim. It's, we showed that it's true. So, um, yeah, these functions equal these things. Um, okay, what's another function that we can deal with? Well, uh, we had a list of, I gave you a list of functions before whose you know, Taylor Maclaurin series it's nice to be familiar with. And I'd like to look at all of those and um, one extra one. So we had e to the x, sine of x, cosine of x. Those all equal their Maclaurin series for all x. Let's look at one where they're not equal for all x. So let's look at the example, but they're equal for some interval of x's around the center, 0. Let's look at f of x equals 1 over. 1 minus x. Um, you can show, it was an exercise, that the Maclaurin series for this is 1 plus x plus x squared. All the coefficients are just 1's in this power series. Okay, that this just keeps going 
All right, but what we'd like to see is that the error term, or when the error term approaches zero, so we're going to need to take a limit. So let me write what Tnx is. Tnx, you go out to the x to the n term. This is a geometric sum. We looked at these back in the, the section on Riemann sum, or before Riemann sums. This is a, a Riemann sum, and if you check, you'll see that we showed that this is equal to 1 minus x to the n plus 1 over 1 minus x. Right? It's, um, this is, we, we need for x not to be 1 to do this. This is if x is unequal to 1. It doesn't matter to us that we're putting in that requirement that x is unequal to 1 because we, we want to know when the limit as n goes to infinity of this equals this function. Well, this function doesn't exist at x equals 1, so we're not bothered by this restriction that x is unequal to 1. Um, let me remind you why this is true. It's kind of fundamental. So that geometric sums, that we have a nice formula for geometric sums. So I'll remind you this is called a, a geometric sum. And it's just a, a trick. <laughs> it's a cool trick that shows you that this equals this. So why? You multiply this whole line by an x. And what you get is x times tnfx equals, and if you multiply by an x, all it does is add one to each exponent, the sum. So you get x plus x squared plus you'll get the term before this would be x to the n minus 1, but then after you multiply by an x, you get x to the n, and then plus the last term, you'll get this multiplied times an x, you'll get an x to the n plus 1. But then you look at this. How does this relate to this? Well, we're missing the 1 that was here, but we gained the n plus 1. So it's this thing. It's t n f x. These are equal, except we subtracted the 1 and we added an x to the n plus 1. If you now solve this algebraically, put the tn fx, well, actually, move this term over here, subtract it, put these two terms over there, and divide, this is what you get. All right. The question is, when does the Maclaurin series, so where you never stop, when does it equal this? That's when does the... Is, the limit as n approaches infinity of the error equal to zero. Well, now that's easy. Now that's easy because what we get is the error term. This time we're not going to use the Lagrange form of the remainder. The error is just f of x minus tn fx. And what we just, so this is 1 over 1 minus x minus 1 minus x to the n plus 1 over 1 minus x. This is, uh, you, the denominators are the same. The 1's cancel. You get the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over 1 minus x. And we want the limit as n goes to infinity to be 0. Make the absolute value of x less than 1. As we, as we said before, if you take something with absolute value less than 1 and raise it to bigger and bigger powers, it approaches 0. This part, this, it stays being 1 minus x. So what do we get? This approaches 0 if the absolute value of x is less than 1. So that's, that's what we get. We don't get that 1 over 1 minus x equals this series. It's... Maclaurin series for all x. We get if the absolute value of x is less than 1, which includes, right, that includes that x is not 1, which we needed for this summation formula. So this is what we get. Yeah, this series converges if the absolute value of x is less than 1, and what it converges to is that.
All right. Um, I want to do one more where I work out the solution, and then I'm going to tell you another special one. And um, then I want to say something about <laughs> what happens with complex numbers and something called Euler's formula. So, So here's another example, and it's one whose Maclaurin series we worked out, or I gave you before, the natural log of 1 plus x. Uh, I want to remind you how the derivatives go so that you can um, see what the, what the error term looks like. So f prime of x is the derivative of natural log, you get 1 over this thing times the derivative of this by the chain rule, but that's just a 1, so you get just a 1 over 1 plus x, or what's the same thing, 1 plus x to the minus 1. Then f double prime, it's just the power rule. The minus 1 comes down as multiplication, you subtract 1 from the exponent, really by the chain rule you multiply times the derivative of 1 plus x, but that's just a 1, so it doesn't show up. f triple prime, the exponent gets multiplied. So it's the power rule again. Now you get a plus 2 times 1 minus x to the minus 3. And the fourth derivative of f at x, and this is, you get a 2 times minus 3. So you get a, a minus 3 times 2 times 1 plus x to the minus 4. You can probably see what's going to happen. Then the next derivative will get a minus 4 times this, and we'll have a 4 times 3 times 2. So what you're getting are factorials with a plus or minus sign. We've seen this before. You get factorials with a plus or minus sign. This exponent is always negative this. What we're getting is that the nth plus first derivative of f at x is, all right, you get a minus sign that alternates. When the, when the derivative is even, you get a minus sign, so that's when n is odd. Well, that's good, so it's minus 1 to the n. That means when n is odd, we'll get a minus 1. When n is even, we get a plus sign. Then we get a factorial that's one less than the derivatives we've taken. That still is n, so this is n factorial. And then we get 1 plus x to the minus the number of derivatives we've taken, minus n plus 1. So this is the formula we get um, for n greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so what? So what does the error term look like? So if we look at the Lagrange form of the remainder uh, of the, well, if we look at the error that we get from the Lagrange form of the remainder, once again using Maclaurin polynomials, this is the absolute value you're supposed to take the n plus first derivative of that evaluated at c over n plus 1 factorial times x to the n plus 1. All right. We put in c is between x and 0. So c, well, c is between 0 and x. All right. So what do you get? Well, you fill this in with a C here, so that's a C there. And I'm going to write this. So we get, um, we're taking absolute values. The absolute value of plus or minus one is just one. So we don't, since we're inside absolute values, we don't need this. We do need the n factorial. We need the absolute value of one plus, we're putting in C for x, one plus C to the minus n plus one. That's that is this part, we lost the minus 1 to the end because we're taking absolute values, times the absolute value, actually, I don't need these big ones, times the absolute value of x to the n plus 1, divided by n plus 1 factorial. Now, we've talked about it before, n factorial divided by n plus 1 factorial. Well, n plus 1 factorial is just the same as n factorial, but then you also multiply it by n plus 1. So, uh, I remind you that n plus 1 factorial is just n plus 1 times n factorial. 
right? Because this means you multiply the integers together, n times n minus 1. You multiply all the integers together between 1 and n. And then n plus 1 factorial just means, oh yeah, you multiply that by another n plus 1. But these n plus 1s cancel. Um, uh, sorry, these n factorials cancel. So you're left with the n plus 1. Here's something to this negative exponent. I'm going to write that in the denominator. So what we end up with is the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 and divided by 1 plus c raised to the n plus 1. All right. We would like to say that regardless of what c is, as long as it's between 0 and x, that as n goes to infinity, this approach is 0. All right. Um, we actually have a little problem. If c could be close to minus 1, then this denominator would be um, very close to 0, and that would make this large. So we want to keep c away from minus 1. In fact, right now, I'm going to assume, so right, we only expect these con convergence to the actual function to be true for some values of x. We'd like for it to be an open interval, or contain an open interval around the center. But right now what I'm going to say is assume, so this won't be an open interval, assume x is between 0 and 1. I'm going to show that you get convergence for x between 0 and 1, and then I'm going to state a better result that we won't actually look, show until next time, until the next section. Right now, let's assume x is between 0 and 1. Then c is between 0 and x, so c is between 0 and 1. So then c is somewhere between 0 and 1. If c is between 0 and 1, this is between 1 and 2. And so the, the smallest the denominator gets is 1 to the n plus 1. And then that makes for the biggest that this fraction gets. So this is always less than or equal to what you'd get when c is 0, which is the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. And we want this to go to 0 as n goes to infinity. Notice this is not n plus 1 factorial. It's just n plus 1, unlike in some of our earlier problems. And it's just not true that for all x, this limit as n goes to infinity is 0. But we've already as assumed our x is between 0 and 1. Well, if x is strictly less than 1, then we know as n goes to infinity, you take something less than 1 and you raise it to power, bigger and bigger powers. This part approaches 0. So this certainly approaches 0 if the absolute value of x is less than 1. If, or if x is less than 1 and greater than or equal to 0. If x is exactly equal to 1, then this numerator is always 1. And then as n goes to infinity, the denominator goes to infinity. So this still goes to 0. So what we conclude <coughs> is that, so what we've just shown is, If x is between 0 and 1, then the natural log of 1 plus x equals its Maclaurin series, which we've looked at before, is just this one. There are no factorials in the denominators. The sign alternates. You get all the terms except the 0 degree term. We've shown this, that this Maclaurin series for the natural log of 1 plus x converges if x is between 0 and 1, and it converges to the value of the function because we know that the error, right, we just showed that the limit as n goes to infinity of the error is 0. <coughs> All right. Um, what we're going to see in the next section is, in fact, that this equality holds for x greater than minus 1 and less than or equal to 1. Well, yeah, it can't hold when x is minus 1 because natural log of 0 is undefined. But yeah, we'll see that other, other arguments will tell us that, in fact, 
we have this equality if x has absolute uh, if x is greater than minus 1. But we showed it's true for x between 0 and 1, including 1. And one cool thing that tells you is that we have this equality when x is 1. When x is 1, what does this say? It says the natural log of 2 equals what you get when you put in x is 1. So that's this. So the natural log of 2 is equal to this. Keep in mind what that means. It means that the natural log of 2 equals the limit of the partial sums of this. So it means you know, if you take 1, and then you take 1 minus a half, and then you take 1 minus a half plus a third, and then you take 1 minus a half plus a third minus a fourth, and you look at the numbers you get as you keep taking more terms, that if you take enough terms, you can make what you get arbitrarily close to the natural log of 2 so that we say the limit so that the limit as you take the limit of the partial sums you get exactly the natural log of 2. Um, this approximation you have to take in very large to get a good approximation to the natural log of 2. This, this series of numbers so this is not a power series that all the x is gone because we plugged in a particular all the references to x are gone because we've plugged in a particular number, this series of numbers is called the, har the alternating harmonic series. If they were all pluses, we'd call it the harmonic series, but it goes plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, so it's the alternating harmonic series. And it's just kind of cool <laughs> that you can say that it adds up to this quantity that the natural log of 2. All right. Um, I want to do one more series, one more important series. I'm not going to derive this. I'll leave it as an exercise. This series I'm about to give you has a name. It was a, a theorem. It was proved by Newton so over 400 years ago. So this is Newton. binomial theorem. Newton was a smart guy. <laughs> it is the 1 plus x to the p. So we want to take the binomial expansion of 1 plus x to the p and you might go, well, I know how to do that. Like if p is 2, you get 1 plus 2x plus x squared and maybe you know what to do when p is 3 what to do when p is, you may even know what to do when p is 4. Probably you may have learned something about Pascal's triangle. But the point is, what about when p is a fraction? What about when p is a half? You can't just, you almost certainly don't know um, a formula for that. Um, what about when p is anything? Just any number at all. Um, can you say anything about this? And the answer is yes. If the absolute value of x is less than 1, so if x is between plus or minus 1, not including plus or minus 1, this equals its Maclaurin series. And the Maclaurin series for this goes like this. 1 plus p times x plus p times p minus 1 over 2 factorial times x squared. This is not hard to show that this is the Maclaurin series. Um, analyzing the error term is a little more complicated, but really um, it's, it's an exercise and you can do it using stuff that we've already done. Um, p times p minus 1 times p minus 2 over 3 factorial times x cubed. I'll write one more plus p times p minus 1 times p minus 2 times p minus 3 over 4 factorial times x to the fourth, and so on. You keep, you get the factorials in the denominator, um, and you get p multiplied times, well, it looks like a factorial where you've left off some terms. Um, you know, you take p times one thing less than p times something two less than p times something three less than p, and you keep doing that. One nice thing about this is that 
one thing you should notice about it is that if p is in fact a positive integer, like p is 2, p is 3, p is 4, all the terms are zero after a certain point. Like, for instance, if p is 3, when p is 3, you'll get a p minus 3. This will be zero, and all the terms after this have p minus 3 in the numerator. It'd be p minus 3 times a p minus 4. All the rest of the terms will be zero. So if, for instance, p is 3, what you're getting is it says you don't have an infinite series anymore. I mean, it is infinite, but most <laughs> all the terms after a certain point are zero, so it's kind of bizarre to think of it as being infinite. Yeah, you add an infinite number of zeros. Well, it doesn't do anything. So you get that this is 1 plus 3 times x plus 3 times 2 over 2 factorial times x squared plus 3 times 2 times 1 so if p is 3, 3 times 2 times 1 over 3 factorial times x cubed. Well, this is just 3, and this is 3 factorial in the numerator, so you get a formula you may have learned before. This is 1 plus 3x plus 3x squared plus x cubed. So the point is that when p is a positive integer, this collapses to kind of the ordinary, everyday binomial expansion. But the real point of this is that this works for, for fractional p's as well, and, and for negative p's. Um, so for instance, it says that, as an example, we'll do p is a half, and we'll pick x is 0.1. We'll pick on 0.1 again. So it, for instance, it tells us that 1 plus x to the 1 half, so again, this is if the absolute value of x is less than 1. Um, this equals 1 plus a half times x plus 1 half times a half minus 1 over 2 factorial times x squared plus 1 half times 1 half minus 1 times 1 half minus 2 over 3 factorial times x cubed, and so on. And yeah, it's kind of nice to know it equals this infinite series, but going back to what we did in the two sections prior to this one, what it means is, part of what it means, is that you can get a good approximation of this by just taking the first few terms, the, you know, the partial sums out to a certain point, like it's very common to say that if x is close to 0, that, so that close to the center, that this is just approximately equal to these first two terms. This is a, a common approximation that 1 plus x to the p is approximately 1 plus p times x if x is close to the center, so if x is close to 0. This gets used all the time, but if you wanted a better approximation than that, or presumably better, you might go out to the next term, and this would be a half times minus a half divided by another two, so that's minus an eighth x squared, and you, know, you could just keep going. Um, you could just take better and better approximations. Um, what do you get if x is 0.1, for instance? We would get that 1.1 to the 1 half is approximately 1 plus a half times 0 0.1 minus an eighth times 0 0.1 squared. Um, if you work this out, well, if you do this on a calculator and you work this out, the calculator gives you that this is 1.048808. Four eight one seven to the accuracy of the display. And this side, which you can easily work out by hand, 1.04875. So, um, you know, it's reasonably accurate with just these first three terms. Here's the 1.048, 1.048. Then there's a 75. This actually has another 8. So, you know, if you round it up, <laughs> they'd be the same to the first four decimal places, but this is a very reasonable approximation with very little effort. 
Um, that's the binomial theorem. There's one last thing I'd like to do in this section, and technically this doesn't belong in a course in, in calculus with the real numbers. And yet it's so important uh, to engineers and, well, to mathematicians, just because it's so cool, um, and, it, and it gets used other places, um, that I want to go ahead and do it. The, um, it. We're going to use complex numbers, and we have to assume that calculus works well with complex numbers, and that everything, so numbers were of the form like 3 plus 4i, where i is the square root of minus 1, and that everything we've said about infinite series works perfectly well with complex numbers also. So the favorite complex variable name is z. So for instance, you might take z as 2 plus 3i, where, where i is the square root of minus 1. Uh, if you work in electrical engineering, you would call this j, but everybody else calls it i, so I'm going to call it i. Um, and the point is that you can do calculus with complex numbers, sine and cosine, and e, the exponential function, exists with complex numbers. And the, the power series look the same. They look the series that you get e to the z is 1 plus z plus z squared over 2 factorial plus z cubed over 3 factorial. You know, of course, math, it doesn't matter whether you call something x or z. I'm writing a z here, so you know, how is this different from what I wrote before? It's not, except I'm writing technically, but I'm writing z to make you think, yes, I can replace z by a complex number, not just a real number. So we have this, and we have the cosine of z. So you get the even powers, starting with 1. The sine alternates, and you divide by the appropriate factorial. So let me write another one up here. And sine of z. You still get the series for sine. Uh, yes, how about the odd powers? All right. So a series that we had before where we're thinking of putting in real numbers, you can also put in complex numbers. And those functions equal their power series for all values of z. Now you may notice that these things kind of involve the same terms. Like this has all the powers of z divided by the corresponding factorials. This has the even powers of z divided by the corresponding factorials. This has the odd powers of z divided by the corresponding factorials. But the signs here alternate, and they don't alternate here. If, if we didn't have all these minuses, if these were all pluses and these were all pluses, we would just add these two series and see that, oh yeah, the sum of this would be this one, and we'd get cosine of z plus sine of z equals e to the z. But it's not true, because the signs are alternating. But Let's see what happens when we replace z by i times some real number. So suppose, and it's frequently the case that that real number in this formula is called theta. You could call it anything. You can call it Fred. You can call it banana. It doesn't matter, but we're going to call it theta. Suppose z is i times theta. Then let's look at let's look at e to the z. So this is e to the i theta. All right. So I put i theta into the series for e to the z. So I get 1 plus i theta plus i theta squared over 2 factorial plus i theta cubed over 3 factorial plus i theta to the fourth over 4 factorial, and so on. Um, let, me, let me write a couple more, because it's easier to see what's going on with more things up here. 
or five factorial plus i theta to the sixth over sixth factorial, and it keeps going. All right. Well, what do powers of i do when you raise, or what happens to i when you raise it to higher power? So here's i. It's the square root of minus 1. So i squared is minus 1. So i cubed is i squared times another i, so it's minus i. i to the fourth, you multiply times another i, you get minus i squared, but i squared is minus 1. You get minus minus 1, you get 1. And then when you multiply by i, you just get, so i to the fifth, you multiply this side by an i, you multiply this back at i, and then it just keeps repeating. So what do the powers of i do? Um, they go i, so I'll just write as i. They go i minus 1 minus i 1, i minus 1 minus i 1, and they just keep repeating. So what you get is e to the i theta, it's 1 plus i theta plus i squared is minus 1, so we get minus theta squared over 2 factorial. Then you get a minus, a minus i, so a minus i times theta cubed over 3 factorial. Then you get an i to the fourth, but i to the fourth is 1 again, so you get a plus a theta to the fourth over 4 factorial. And then you get a minus, um, uh, sorry, then you get a plus i theta to the fifth over 5 factorial, right? It just repeats. <laughs> the powers go, there's a 1, i, a minus 1, and a minus i. A 1, an i, a minus 1, and a minus i. So a minus theta to the 6 over 6 factorial. The next thing would be um, a minus i to the 7th over 7 factorial, and so on. All right, we're almost where we want to be. If Look at, look at the terms that don't have an i multiplied times them. 1 minus theta squared over 2 factorial plus theta to the 4th over 4 factorial minus theta to the 6 over 6 factorial. You're getting exactly this. Where if theta is real, this is just a real series like we just dealt with. Um, if theta is imaginary, so a complex number itself, this is still true. Um, but it's not as familiar to us. And let me go ahead and put a theta in here if you replace z by theta. If theta is real, this is what we were looking at before, but with an x in it. Um, do you see that here? Yeah, if you look at the odd-powered terms and factor out an i, you see a theta minus, ignore the i, we're factoring out minus theta cubed over 3 factorial plus theta to the fifth over five factorial, minus theta to the seventh over seven factorial. Yeah, the odd terms are just i times sine. What we're getting is the even terms, if you pick those out, those are the cosine of theta. And all the rest of the terms are i times the sine of theta. This is Euler's formula. Euler's formula, it's extremely important. e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. You can do lots of things with this. One of, this, one of them is you can derive the angle addition formulas very easily because if you multiply e to the i alpha times e to the i beta, the exponents just add. So you get an e to the alpha plus beta. And then if you then that would be cosine of alpha plus beta plus i sine of alpha plus beta. But then if you wrote e to the i alpha and e to the i beta out like this and do the multiplication, and then you pick out the real and imaginary parts, you get the angle addition formulas very quickly. Um, one cool thing, so that's an exercise. One cool thing, and you see this formula on like math mugs and math t-shirts and other places, if you put in theta equals pi, you get e to the i pi equals the cosine of pi. The cosine of pi is minus 1 plus i times the sine of pi. The sine of pi is 0. 
right? So you get this, or people like to write it add one to both sides, e to the i pi plus one equals zero. What's so thrilling about that? Well, first of all, this is just cool. <laughs> you take the x, it relates e and pi in a way. e and pi look completely independent. How are they related in any way? And yet, if you take e and raise it to the i pi, you get minus one. So it's weird that there's that relation. Um, weird, cool. And this, e to the i pi plus one equals zero, people like writing it like that because it's one formula that's true and contains basically the five most fundamental constants in mathematics, e, i, pi, uh, one, and zero, all in one, one neat formula. All right, so in this section, we looked at, you start with a function, and we looked at when does it equal its Taylor series. In fact, we used all Maclaurin series. That means that the, the Maclaurin series or Taylor series had to converge. And what it had to converge to was the function that we started with. In the next section, we just want to start with a power series that maybe was a Maclaurin series or Taylor series of some function that we already know that has a name, like e to the x or sine of x. But we want to just start with a power series and look at when you can use it to define a function and why you'd want to do that and what properties it has and, um, and, and look at applications of it and see some beautiful mathematics too, although it gets a little theoretical and difficult. We'll do that in the next section.